You are listening to the Overwatch League Network, the podcast with Deadeye on all the Overwatch League news and information, the show with Tactical Visor on the statistics and analysis. Here are your hosts, Totally Drunk, Spider, and Slambo. Welcome back to Overwatch League Network, the podcast with Dead and all the latest Overwatch League news, information, and esports analysis. I am your host, Emily Drunk, and tonight on episode 51, we're going to go around the league discussing the latest Overwatch League news. The battle for California continues outside of the regular season. Shanghai finds a new coach from Korea. Leaks bring in the drama and the spice, and quite possibly rumored to be what could be the uh the biggest return in overwatch and so much more but before we can get into the news and introduce you to my co-host i just want to take a moment to thank everyone who is hanging out with us tonight live for our twitch show and of course thank all of our repeat listeners of course as always i do have someone here with me to help break everything down and as you can tell i am without my soulmate yet again uh he is feeling a little green so he is not going to be with us here tonight so hopefully my soulmate slambo can uh rest up and come back for the next one and hopefully you know not get you know sucked back into the abyss and all that good stuff but joining me tonight is the man that's been plugging away on the PTR, our video wizard himself, Spider. Spider, how are you doing tonight? Ooh, what's going on, man? I I could <laughs> I couldn't do it, man. That's that's Slambo's thing. So uh, doing good, man. the The PTR came up, and I've been having a lot a lot of fun on Torbjorn. I've actually plugged in about. 10 quick play games that I've been able to actually pick Torbjorn and play him. Got some footage uh, ready to go when all that stuff goes live. Uh, I like to do our videos when the patch actually goes live because they keep saying they're going to change stuff. So I don't want to put out a video that gets outdated immediately. I don't think that will ever happen because it's never happened in the past. They just push the PTR out live regardless. Um, but, you know, this would be the one chance they do it. So I'm, I'm getting that Torbjorn stuff for you. I'm getting... Uh, you know, the soldier changes, the soldier changes are huge. Like on, on paper, it was like, oh, OK, you got a minor buff. And then when you see him go like full auto, it is ridiculous. So uh, but other than that, you know, just leveling the the ham fisted taco account. Uh, you and I played Friday night at varying levels of success, but uh, it, it was a lot of fun. And that's that's why I made that account. I, I just wanted to have a lot of fun. And then, you know, we got some pretty good Overwatch over the weekend. I didn't get to watch all of it, but I got to watch most of the important matches. And, you know, we'll we'll definitely break it down for the night. But how about you? I know you were pretty busy all weekend into today. Yeah, um, well, like, you know, Friday, yeah, we did play a bit. Um, I picked up another alt account thanks to the uh, Humble Monthly. So you know, I picked up that for, you know, 12 bucks. So it's another uh, alt account. So I got to lead Loopy all set up. That's going to be like my... My main tank account so uh yeah we we did we did okay uh but you know i i just really haven't put in a ton of time into like reinhardt or arista uh so i'm trying to learn the other main tank roles because that's really like the only role that i haven't specifically like honed in on in regards to competitive play usually i'm filling you know off tank or flex support uh nowadays but you know it's just something different for me to do and uh you know just learning a different aspect of the game since most of my time was either on winston or diva you know just running straight dive uh for all of those seasons uh but over the weekend we had dusk till dawn uh, at the dixon drive-in so yeah as uh as the title basically says like that was from dusk until dawn uh so i was out pretty much all <laughs> night into the next morning and luckily i've been off the past couple of days so i gotta gotta rest after that but today there's just been a lot of stuff going on around the house doing a lot of cleaning uh we power washed the house so uh that that was the thing we took down some trees and uh yeah i'm tetrising my room around quite a bit uh hung up some art prints which you can see behind me uh but just just a whole lot going on kind of like behind the scenes and uh it's definitely cut into my world cup viewing experience this weekend with everything just happening at once so uh i did you know, watch some of the marquee games, some of the bigger 
uh, caliber matches that we were expecting them to be. And, uh, you know, my prediction of UK coming out on top was not actually uh, the case, but France did look strong with, you know, Poco, Ben Best. Uh, we got to see a little bit of Nico as mm -hmm. well, so I was happy to see that. And, uh, yeah, France looking pretty strong overall, running the triple tank, triple support. So, uh, no surprise there, an EU team is strong with heavy tanks. Like, who would have known? <laughs> It, it was pretty funny, though, because at one point they played another team that ran quad tank, and apparently four tanks is not better than three tanks. Uh, it, it The quad tank double support just got absolutely smashed. But, yeah, it it was fun, and, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it, so I'll save all my thoughts for that later. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and let's jump into this week's news as we go around the league. So first up, we have an update for you on Contenders Season 3. That will actually be kicking off in November. Uh, so that was announced during the Contenders Europe Finals, which took place this past weekend. Uh, and that was Eagle Gaiman coming out on top over Angry Titans. So Eagle Gaiman, uh, the French team formerly, uh, well, it does have former Rogue members. Uh, so I guess it's new Rogue uh, in a sense. But, rogue Light. Uh, yeah, pretty much. But uh, <laughs> they're goats compared to the world cup goats i would say looked a lot better uh it seems like a lot of the world cup teams have been screaming against eagle gaming because of how good they are on that comp and uh yeah needless to say we did see a ton of triple tank triple support this past weekend just due to that and i mean really that's kind of been the case throughout all of the world cup but uh right now you know the tier two scene is shifting into contenders trials uh, so we are trying to determine who will be qualifying for the upcoming season of Contenders, which, as I said, kicks off in November. Now, that being said, obviously, Season 3 is going to be shaping up a little bit differently just because, you know, right now we are going through the free agent sign-in window for the Overwatch League. Uh, of course, right now, it is exclusively to the expansion teams and will open up for the remainder of the teams here uh, next month. But, you know, we're expected to see, like, an increase of Academy teams, especially on the Contenders North America side. You know, last season, eight of the 12 teams were Academy teams, and, you know, we have an influx of expansion teams. So are you expecting to see, like, maybe all of Contenders and A made up of these affiliate teams? Or do you think there's still some room for some of these uh, non-endemic organizations to still make a play here? I think there'll always be a couple of spots, but uh, I would definitely lean more heavily into like the academy teams especially with the new uh you know player system where they can have players between both teams if they want to have like you know just fill in spots here and there and you know coach players through both but yeah i think there's always going to be a spot for those you know the fnrg fe's you know the the corn dog spot i'll call it where the the spots where they're not sponsored they're the up-and-comer team you know the underdogs uh all of that so i I, I hope so. Like, I, I hope we don't get, you know, just what, like, the major league structure is where it's all, like, baseball is a good example. That it's all teams already affiliated with other teams because that gets kind of boring. It's like, okay, so this team's already, you know, all its players has to go to New York or this team's players has to go to D.C. and stuff like that. So um, I think with the expansion of the league, contenders is going to expand. And from there, there's going to open up more spots. So even though the the team roster in Overwatch League will grow, that means the contender spots will grow, and that means there'll always be a couple of spots that they're going to have to you know plug and play with just to keep things even. And I hope that's how it turns out at least. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm just excited for contenders in general. I mean, I that's that's what we got for the next few months. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty much. And you know. Speaking of, like, expanded, I'm really hoping that, you know, maybe we'll go from instead of having six from each group to maybe going to eight. So, you know, we'll still have, like, four additional slots. Uh, but, you know, we do have all of these expansion teams coming in. Do you expect that we will have academy teams for each of them? Because, like, when we kind of look at the landscape right now, even the teams that didn't have an affiliate team last season are in a position where they are wanting to acquire one for this upcoming season. I'd like to say yes, but it seems like these tier two teams are not the tier two, the season two teams 
might have to relearn the lessons that the season one teams that didn't have affiliate teams are going to learn uh, because we've heard no word on that. And I'm sure the focus is going to be on the main team. You know, Overwatch League is is the golden child. So that's the one that they're going to want to focus on. But I, I would highly doubt that of all of the expansion teams, we're going to see affiliate teams, especially, especially in the EU region. Now, we may see affiliate teams for like dc and vancouver and the airports but uh, i think once you get into like three chinese teams i think that's going to get a little dicey so we'll, we'll see i i hope the teams do it because if anything it just benefits the team with the new player system but you know that's that's a lesson some teams are going to have to learn the hard way well, yeah, when you look at the chinese scene right now only shane high has an expansion team so there are a lot of you know, what could be affiliate spots in that uh, region. Same with Contenders Korea. So we do know that the Dynasty are one of those teams that last season did not have an academy team. They're going into season two looking to have an academy team for Contenders Korea, which is by far the most stacked region mm -hmm. out of all of the contenders. So it, it, it's very curious. It's like, well, is are the Dynasty like going to go out and just pick up one of these rosters to be their affiliate roster or is this going to be a situation where uh you know maybe they're just going to pick up maybe some of the unknowns and you know maybe pick up bits and pieces but either way like that is a tall order if you are the dynasty because not only are you trying to restructure your main roster but you're also trying to find people that could potentially be perceived as two-way players to play both in contenders and on your main roster in the overwatch league yeah, going forward, I think we're going to see very little like wholesale teams. I think every team in the Korea region is going to be like mix and match. It's just going to be you're going to have to find a bunch of players, especially with the way this off season's going. It seems like, you know, certain Korean teams are just getting picked up. Like we have a lot of rumors that whole teams are being picked up. So you may be able to to snag a like tier two, tier three korean team like an up-and-coming team you know like what we considered element misket ele wow <laughs> long day Work. element mystic going into their their apex run um mm -hmm. but you know now with all the teams picking it up and florida like picking up every korean player that it, there is i i think you're just gonna have to mix and match it All right, well, moving forward, we do have an update for you in regards to uh, some outside of regular season play, and that <laughs> is the battle for California continuing uh, with the LA Valiant and the San Francisco Shock. So they, these two teams have scheduled some exhibition matches ahead of the preseason, uh, which, you know, we still don't know when that's going to be. Obviously, we'll have more details once we get closer to BlizzCon. Mm -hmm. uh, but these exhibition matches are going to be played in their respective areas in what they have dubbed the California Cup. <laughs> now, things are going to kick off on October 20th in Santa Ana, with the second day being held on November 10th in Oakland. And these matches are going to be played at the Esports Arena locations, both in Santa Ana and Oakland. So, you know, not only are we getting that, but, you know, there's also going to be some collegiate competition between four different california schools i know they have planned uh, some player signing sessions there's vip perks as well as exclusive merchandise being made available at these events so if you're in the area general admission tickets are available for either event for 25 dollars if you want the vip treatment those tickets will run you 50 dollars and then if you want to attend both of these with a vip you can get a package deal for 75 dollars so pretty pretty good deal overall there uh, so, you know, this is going to be the first match between these Overwatch League teams, kind of like outside of L.A., you know, playing in front of their home crowd, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, so who knows, like, maybe these esports arenas could be considered the home stadiums once we do get into, you know, the home and away, uh, you know, runs once we get to Season 3. Uh, but on top of that, this is just our first look at what could be considered, you know, these new-look rosters for both, you know, the Shock and the Valiant. Yeah, I mean, this is actually a really neat idea that they came up with. Uh, it keeps the buzz generating in the off season. We get to do a field test, uh, Abbott, a very short field test of travel and um, playing in 
in different locations, like you said. So uh, overall, I think this is just a good idea all around. Um, I don't, while I know both teams can fill full teams, like they, they have players in every spot, I don't know to what caliber we're going to see them play. Uh, I don't really expect like stage four Valiant to come out swinging. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, who knows what we're going to see from the shock because a, a lot of them are, well, not a lot of them, but some of them are on the World Cup team. So they could be burnt out. They could, be, you know, it, there's a lot of stuff that's going to go into this. Uh, same thing with the Valiant, actually, just in other regions. Uh, but I, I'm I'm excited to see how this goes. I hope they stream it. They haven't announced anything in, in terms of, like, streaming it and putting it out to the public other than, you know, give us your money and you can come watch us and, you know, stuff like that, which is cool. I mean, if you're on the West Coast, but I, I won't be going. But overall, um, you know, it it's off season. Let them let them play. Let let's see some ex- exhibition matches. Absolutely. So we do have some movement in regards to coaching staffs, and you know, uh, one of the teams that has been cleaning house uh, to a different severity, of course, was the Shanghai Dragons. Uh, so you know, they started off by releasing two of their coaches uh, before moving on to. Uh, release eight of their players from their roster. <laughs> and so the coach and staff releases left their head coach position vacant, and the team has turned to uh, Blue has to try to turn their luck around. Obviously, you know, everyone saw how Shane Hype played out, and, uh, you know, trying to Overwatch World Cup, looking pretty promising, but uh, we'll, we'll see how it how that shakes up in the top eight, which I'm pretty excited to see. Uh, but Blue has joins the Dragon dragons after he pre- previously served as a coach for Kondu Panthera. Now Kondu finished second in contenders Korea this past season uh, and they lost to Runaway 4 to 3 in what was an eight map series because there was a draw in that grand finals and if you if you guys have not seen the Runaway versus KDP match from contenders Korea this past season you need to just go watch that immediately after this podcast because it was it's one of the best series that you will see bar none uh, mm-hmm. but anyways so kdp their performance in contenders season two was just a steep improvement over their season one performance this was a team that went from eighth place in season one to finishing as a runner up uh in season two so incredible turnaround for this team and a lot of that was off of the back of their coaching and just the strategy behind this team so, with that being said, Spider, is this a sign that, you know, maybe we'll be seeing some of these Kondu players signing with the Shanghai Dragons and, you know, maybe seeing a bit more of a Korean roster as opposed to a split? Yeah, so Shanghai is going to be the Korean Chinese team. Like, that that that's basically how it's going to be. Now, whether they end up with a lot of Kondu players or, you know, they mix and match... Um, it it could go anyway. I mean, they still have Dia on the team, so he is Chinese. Uh, I could see them using Dia to like bait out a trade, or just you know they could keep him. He Dia is a really good player, and I feel like Dia could excel even if it is a mostly Korean roster because he was one of the few standouts. But I I am hesitant to say this is a good first start for them. I mean. They, they are making the right moves. Like, they they are making the necessary moves in the offseason. But I need to know more about the roster before I say, okay, yeah, they, they've made the right choice. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, this is this is a good starting point. I, I feel like Shanghai just jettisoning their whole roster, keeping three people, basically the three people that actually did perform last season. Like, they, they're, they're shining star in the otherwise sea of dirt. Um, <laughs> what... I, I, like I said, they're, they're making the right moves. So I, I don't want to draw this out too much just because I have a feeling in the coming weeks we're going to hear a lot of Shanghai news, uh, especially when the full trade, uh, you know, opens up and we're outside of these expansion teams. But until then, uh, I hope they do better. Like, I, I hope they don't continue to be the meme because that would be sad. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, if the rumor mill has shown anything, it could be that only one of the Chinese teams will be a Chinese team. Most of the other ones are looking like they're going to be pretty uh, heavily Korean influenced. You know, minus minus a couple Chinese players sprinkled in here and there, one of which might be the main tank for the Chinese <laughs> World Cup team. That doesn't that doesn't matter. I mean, 
the the crowd chanted USA for Dallas Fuel and they had one American player and they don't even have that now so it doesn't matter you just you pick a team that's in your region and you say all right well they I hope they pick the best players and then you get behind them uh and you know I'm going to have to struggle with that once DC has a team because I'm like yay fuel ah oh, crap I have a team like right next to me now I got a question for you okay so obviously you know Shanghai got a lot of fanfare last season. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to carry over into season two? And if so, do you think that Korean influence is going to help elevate it that much more? Oh, absolutely. Like, they they are going to be a meme until they get that first win. So whether that win comes week one, game one, you know, at any point, they are just going to be, like, shooting the Twitch numbers up. Uh, except in China now, because you can't watch Twitch in China. But <laughs> shooting shooting the Twitch numbers up the rest of the place, places, because everybody wants to see Shanghai win. Like, it, you know, even at the end of the season, when it was like, Shang, what was it, like week four of stage four, where like Shanghai versus Florida was the most watched match of the week. Like, this was the two worst teams in the league, and people were just like, come on, Shanghai, you can do it. This is your chance. They they didn't do it, but you know, it, I think going forward, I think that's going to be like you're, you're going to get hyped for you know, like the London New York match, or you're going to get hyped for the new team matches, and then you're going to get hyped for Shanghai's first match because you're going to be like, oh, let's see what they can really do now. Absolutely, I can't wait to see when that's going to happen because yeah, like Shanghai when they were facing Florida, they they had a win condition going on, and then the viewership. Just, kept spiking and just then win they they kind of <laughs> shit the bed yeah that's among other things that's the <laughs> nicest way to say it yeah uh, but anyways speaking of coaching news we do have another uh actually we have two players joining the coaching staff for the washington dc overwatch league franchise so you know they've been pretty busy as of late uh, and the franchise has signed avala and mkl i'm not gonna say michael because that would just confuse people just going to say MKL because we are going to be talking about, you know, a certain leak boy uh, here in just a little bit. Not the number two tracer. Yes. He's he, borderline top 50. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, uh, Avella and MKL will be joining Wizard Hyun on the coaching staff for this DC Overwatch League franchise. Uh, so as of right now, DC is the only expansion team still to have signed a player. Obviously, they turn to former NYXL main tank Janus. And if we look at the past, Avala, she had worked as an assistant coach for Optic Academy back in Contenders Season 1 over in North America. Uh, Optic Academy being the Houston Outlaws Academy team before they rebranded to GG Esports Academy. And then she would move uh, to coach for Metabellum as the assistant coach in Contenders Korea Season 2. Now, in both of these seasons, her team's... Uh, had made the playoffs, so she does have playoff coaching experience, which is a huge plus. And her sign is actually the first female coach sign-in for the Overwatch League. And then when we look at MKL, uh, MKL actually worked with Avala for the Optic Academy in Contenders NA Season 1. And then Avala would later move on to become an analyst for last night's Leftovers in Contenders Season 2. And, you know, we've already kind of talked about uh, the link between this DC Overwatch League team and last night's leftovers because you know the dc gm kate mitchell was manager of lnl before you know she got that promotion <laughs> uh so for mkl this is the first norwegian to play or you know coach in the overwatch league and uh when we look at the lnl organization this marks the fourth member of last night's leftovers to join an expansion team going into season two so far so you know, we're always talking about uh, how coaching experience is a big plus. And when you look at Avala, like, I, you know, I hate to say it, but like her, her pedigree is even better than some of the current coaches in the league, which is definitely saying something. Yeah, I mean, you know, you could get all pro Overwatch League and pro Overwatch. Like, it's one of the most inclusive scenes in the, in the game and stuff like that. But Avala has put in the work. Like, she has done the work. She is one of the best uh, coaches at least available in in any region really she like you said she has the pedigree so i think she deserves this chance i i actually from what i understand of her and what i've seen from her results i'm surprised she didn't get picked up as a head coach somewhere 
but I think Wizard really liked what he saw in her, and you know I'm sure he had some input as well. And just the whole team in general, and obviously Kate Mitchell, uh, is just cherry picking everybody except for Harsha. And mm-hmm. uh, I I I think DC's doing the right thing. I think DC's um, speaking in the broader picture. I think the fact that they're so in your face with these signings, like regardless of what they are, they they're like we we signed a you know bathroom cleaner like it doesn't matter like they're they are keeping themselves in the news for the overwatch league and i think that's really important because these other expansion teams we heard the announcement and then we've heard nothing so like if i asked the average overwatch league fan what the expansion teams were they could probably say like toronto but they definitely say washington dc and then they'd probably leave out a few of them, like especially like how many Chinese teams are there going to be, like stuff like that. So I think keeping yourself in the news is the right way to do it. Um, and back to Avala, like circling back around, back to Avala, I think this is absolutely an amazing pickup for them, just based off her pedigree. Absolutely. So, you know, this is really the second team that's uh, been making a lot of movement in regards to coaching staff for the expansion teams. You know, Atlanta being the other team Mm -hmm. uh, or the airports, depending on, you know, how you want to market them. Uh, But anyways, (laughs) we do have some movement over uh, with the Florida Mayhem. So the Florida Mayhem have first turned to their academy team uh, to strengthen their roster. So moving out from the Mayhem Academy in preparation for the second season is their flex support player. Hako Pune. So, Mayhem Academy had edged out GG Esports Academy, which is, as I said prior, the Outlaws Academy team, to earn a playoff spot, but did fall short in the quarterfinals to XL2 Academy, who were last season's runner-ups, and you know, as we saw, they kind of got the... They got stomped by uh, Fusion University. Very one-sided. And, uh, yeah, one of the most one-sided affairs we've seen, even when you compare it to uh, some of the four rows we've seen in the World Cup this season uh but this is going to be hago pune's second chance in the overwatch league after prior playing for the london spitfire uh he had come out of the gc busan camp and you know we saw uh the struggles that london had trying to incorporate all the pieces that they did have eventually you know london figured their shit out you know they dropped a ton of people from their roster and some of them <laughs> were kind of traded away mid-season and you know they would go on to you know win the first season so uh you know they took some time but they got there unlike some teams uh but this promotion for hagopune brings the mayhem up to five players so the mayhem are in needing uh to sign three players to meet the league's required player minimum for league play and the free agent signing window is going to open up on october 8th after the exclusive expansion free agent signing window closes now we did get an announcement uh it was like four hours ago uh, before we started recording this podcast, that there was a little bit more movement out of the Mayhem camp, and that is that they have signed Apply to a two-way contract. So Apply is a projectile DPS player who is currently on the Mayhem Academy. So uh, as a two-way player, this means that Apply is eligible for both play in Contenders and the Overwatch League. So with that being said, you know, this is our first two-way player sign-in for the Overwatch League for Season 2. And, you know, like, I have to say, like, Hagopune being uh, promoted, really no surprise. He has the pedigree. He has the experience already. He's already played on the big stage. And uh, he definitely, uh, like, being in contenders was, uh, I mean, it was a demotion, really. I mean, he had his opportunity. Things didn't work out. But he still wanted to stay in pro play. Uh, And, you know, Mayhem Academy didn't, wasn't necessarily like that like the best team but he did shine on that roster but apply for me is just kind of like i i have a feeling like this is not going to be a player that's going to be seeing a ton of play but you know maybe this is a hint that maybe Tavik is going to be seeing more play for the mayhem and maybe not being seen as uh perceived trade bait <laughs> if the mayhem roster does try to uh bring in more korean players yeah, I mean, both pieces together are interesting. Now, like you said, Hagapon isn't isn't surprising. Like the the fact that he they took this long to announce it actually surprised me because he was kind of the standout. Like he he is like Rascal. Like when Rascal got demoted to contenders, 
Uh, it's kind of like, no, you you should be in the Overwatch League. Definitely. Um, but, yeah, Apply, I, I that one confused me. Like, I feel like they, they did that just to put another player on the roster, to bring them closer to that cap of the Florida Mayhem rule. Because I'm, I'm curious to see, <laughs> like, how few players Florida gets away with this time. Because... Uh, from what we've heard behind the scenes, Florida has one of the worst infrastructures behind them. And I mean, that was, that's pretty obvious if you hear any of the stories from last season, like to Vic driving the bus and, you know, stuff like that. Uh, they live like an hour away from the arena, all, all kinds of things here and there. So I, I am curious to see if this is just purely a move to add a player onto that Overwatch League roster to get them closer to that cap. I hope not, and I, I really hope I can come back and say, boy, that was just a crazy theory, because I, I hope they learn their lesson. Like, they they shouldn't play that way. Like, they you can't win that way. Um, but they, they have been leaning so hard into that Korean roster that apply definitely sticks out. Uh, you know, to Vic, we were both pretty convinced that he was trade bait or... You know, we'll we'll see him graduate to coach or assistant coach as a lot of the Gen One players are doing, uh, or just graduate to bus driver. Like I don't I don't know their internal structure. Or kebab getter. Kebab getter. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah, that's what I want to be when I grow up. Kebab getter. Um, that sounds really dirty. Kebab getter. <laughs> but uh, it. You know, I I'm curious to see what the mayhem go go with forward they they had such a i don't say strong but they had a good um contenders roster so i feel like they they should mix and match but i really feel like they're still going korean i don't know why i just just have this gut feeling that they're just going to keep picking up korean players yeah i wouldn't say they're a good academy team compared to the field uh but you know this was a team that you know in season one tried to skate by with the bare minimum. So I'm hoping this isn't a sign that uh, it's going to be a repeat of last season because, you know, from the outside looking in, it kind of does seem like they are going down that path again. So, you mm -hmm. know, there's a very good chance that uh, if things stay the same, that Florida Mayhem is, again, going to be looking like a bottom three team in the league, uh, which definitely is not where you want to be uh, if you're Mayhem right now. Uh, no. So. Well, well, we'll have to see how these two-way players are going to be played and, you know, how much of it is going to be within the Overwatch League and how much of this is just going to be, like, say, you know, people that would have been bench players, essentially, for the Overwatch League get into practice and still see play just in the Tier 2 scene. So I have a feeling there'll be a healthy mix between the two, uh, but I am just curious to see how many of these Tier 2 players are going to get promoted and see more time in the Overwatch League as opposed to... Uh, with these academy teams, uh, but by the looks of it, like I, I, I feel like there, there's only a couple of players that I could see actually getting uh, the promotion to a two-way player and seeing uh, a serviceable amount of time. You know, uh, like one of the big names that definitely comes to mind is like say Nene from the XL2 Academy, uh, Rascal from Energy, uh, mm -hmm. could definitely be one of those players for the shock. And who knows, maybe. Maybe Rascal is going to be this announcement that we're expecting from the Shock uh, that they've been kind of teasing. You know, the announcement of an announcement tweets, guys. Yeah, very original. <laughs> uh, that's It's been done way that's too many times. That's the Shock's times. MO. That's been yeah, their MO that's, since that's the beginning. That's what they do. Um, <laughs> but anyways, moving on. We, we got to kind of... We need to look into the rumor mill just a little bit. Uh, so there has been a lot of talk going on in regards to some of these reports uh some of these rumors that have been going on and a lot of them stem from one party <laughs> that being the birthday boy himself because today is his birthday uh the number 50 tracer michael so this off season has brought us quite a bit of spice uh and a lot of that is just based on the fact that, you know, we have seen more leakers kind of uh, come into the surface. You know, we have Michael, uh, there's Halo, Bench Mob, Real Leak Boy. Slasher's kind of like taking a backseat. <laughs> and <laughs> as I had to realize is that you challenged him to an Anoff. Yes, that is true, Adenar. 
Uh, but at the forefront of all of these rumors and leakers is the former Kangarna player slash team owner, Michael. So, Michael had implicated that DC general manager, Kate Mitchell, had offered multiple players and staff members Overwatch League jobs before retracting offers. <laughs> And the former SF Shock analyst Harsha was name dropped in this video that Michael released. Now, Kate wasn't uh, reached for in regards to a comment before this video went up and said uh, she had a follow up that the video was riddled with errors, presented irresponsibly, and was posted without request for comment from the subjects. You know, the subjects being both her and Harsha. And obviously, we haven't heard from Harsha in regards to these reports, uh, but he had left the shock. You know, a day or two before this video uh, had surfaced. Uh, we did see DC come out with an issued statement saying that the situation had been mischaracterized and that this isn't the full story. Uh, and it's kind of like put Michael in a little bit of hot water with a lot of the competitive community. And uh, it kind of escalated kind of after the fact because he had posted a rumor about the LA Valiant and that the Valiant were planted on benching agilities in favor of KSF. Now, this tweet basically brought out an immediate response from the Valiant CEO, Noah Winston. Now, I, I'm i pretty sure this tweet thread had been deleted since then, uh, but Noah was going for the jugular. <laughs> and uh, it's because of these stories that there's been a lot of talk in regards to uh, leak and like report processing and Sideshow had a, a, a pretty good tweet about this. He tweeted that journalistic process and ethics are there for good reason. You shouldn't encourage people who have clearly not done basic research and are driven by desire for fame, even if what they say has been mostly correct. The sensationalism and lack of checks will do more damage. Now, for the most part, you know, Michael has been leaking a ton of stuff, uh, the vast majority of which has been true. Uh, but, you know, there is a very fine line when it comes to uh, this process, and you really have to be respectful to all these parties involved, because putting out information like this could potentially ruin, you know, someone's career. It is a definite mark on a new franchise, let alone the Overwatch League. So, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of back and forth in regards to the community, a lot of people you know, trying to stick up for Kate or stick up for Michael, whichever side you're on. But, uh, you know, this is what we want from the offseason. We want these reports. We want this spice. And, you know, while the while the uh, announcements aren't going to be uh, very common, this definitely adds more juice to the discussion, which is always fun to, uh, to toy around with. You're muted. <laughs> can't hear the spider can you hear me now oh, i can hear you Woo! thank you <laughs> uh so yeah boy did this uh this blew up really quick didn't it uh i was i was hoping i would get to talk about this uh but you you nailed all the fun parts man i so it's it's gonna be hard to follow it up but yeah i mean this you have to do due diligence when you're reporting this kind of stuff now i i know uh the number two tracer the top 50 tracer whatever you want to call him uh, michael doesn't consider himself a journalist at least he didn't at this point in time when he put this out he he later retracted it after he got in the fight on twitter and put out a twit longer basically saying that you know moving forward i'm going to do my due diligence i'm going to ask for comment i'm going to hold myself to a higher journalistic integrity that i should have been doing all along which i think is good for him because he basically in a roundabout way said i i fucked up that that's that's all he did he basically said it if you read the twit longer he says like this this wasn't the way i should have did it um i i heard a very you know, controversial rumor. It sounded like it was true. I thought I had verified it with the people, the people involved. Uh, and then, you know, he just went on to say, I didn't do what I needed to do and good for him. I mean, that, that as much as we rip on him, at least he was man enough to say that, yeah, I screwed up. So going forward, I think we're going to get a lot more, uh, tight lipped Michael. 
I think he's going to be real careful what he puts out, especially in the coming weeks. But I, I don't expect him to go full silent. Like, I, I think he's kind of, at this point, he he's taken the blows, so he wants to keep going. And I could see him becoming a very good, like, outside Overwatch reporter. He has the rapport with the players. Uh, he's kind of tarnished that a little bit right here. Uh, and, you know, all the stuff he's done in the past. But he at least knows all the players, and he has a rapport with some of them. Uh, so I, I think going forward, I think he's he's learned from this and it just goes to show if you want to be a journalist if you have inside in information just just verify it man like it, it it's it, i i took a lot of journalism classes and the, the first thing they teach you is reach out for a comment record everything they say even if they just say no comment and then you can publish your story as as much as you want and then just say when when they when we reach them for a comment they said no comment and you know, at that point, it's it the ball is in their court because you've shown that you've done all the the right things. If had he done that and she still denied it, this would be a very different story. It would basically be like, okay, well, he put out a a rumor about Agilities and then Agilities shot it down and stuff like this. But at least he reached them for a comment. Uh, but now it makes him look like a dick. So, <laughs> it that like you said, there there's a very fine line for journalism uh, and. I think he's going to learn from this and I hope he does because I, I don't want to get all our leaks from slasher. Like I, I want, I, I want, I don't want there be to be a monopoly on leaks, I guess is the best way to say it. I, right. I want to get, I want to get spice from different, different locations. <laughs> yeah. And you know, we, we kind of have seen that because, you know, we, we have seen quite a few reports from bench mob mm -hmm. and Halo and Michael. Yep. Uh, and while nothing is 100% concrete, you know, there are a lot of rumblings about Vancouver signing, you know, the Korean champions of contenders. Right. Uh, who, by the way, uh, if you guys are looking for more, you know, competitive Overwatch, there is a tournament tomorrow that features Runaway, LGD Gaming, T1W, and Lingon Esports. So definitely check that out. And, you know, Runaway. There's a lot of links to uh, Vancouver and Runaway, so I, I'm i really hoping that's the case. And, uh, you know, there was a number thrown out there in regards to, like, a buyout price. I don't know if you saw that tweet uh, in regards to Runaway, but, like, when I saw that number, like, I was, like, my eyes widened. Like, I was like, I think the number they said was, like, 3 million. Like, it was really Ooh. out there, which would be absolutely massive and just astronomical compared to the other numbers that we have heard about uh but getting back on track here one of the bigger stories that has come out since you know this whole dc situation from michael uh which honestly like to me this is going to be one of the biggest stories of the offseason if this does come to fruition uh so halo and michael uh have both said that defran is looking to return to professional overwatch you know, Halo had originally reported uh, about this rumor that DeFran was looking to join a contenders team or the new Atlanta Overwatch League franchise. Michael would later go on to confirm that DeFran has been reaching out to multiple academy teams. And this is a player that really made a name for himself <laughs> as part of Selfless Gaming. And at the time was considered to be one of the top players in North America, mostly known for his hit scan primarily on Soldier 76. Uh, and, you know, we, we've all kind of seen the story of DeFran. You know, he kind of landed in hot water after he was throwing competitive games. You know, he was grieving in rank play a lot of times on stream. Mm. And he ended up getting suspended. You know, we went through, like, this whole hashtag throw for DeFran movement. And it was just a toxic time in Overwatch. And people were just throwing because of you know, DeFran being banned for grieving and all of this shit. Uh, <laughs> and it seems like right now DeFran's deal is currently being reviewed by Blizzard because uh, DeFran is being vetted. Now, if approved, DeFran is looking to join the Atlanta franchise team. And again, you know, this is all rumors, but, you know, two of the different leakers have reported this. So, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire, right? <laughs> uh, right. So... I, I have a couple of questions, Spider. One, how big of a sign-in is this to you? What do you think this means for uh, Atlanta? And what sort of impact do you think this is going to have knowing the soldier changes we have seen on the PTR? Because uh, 
Yeah, the PTR changes for Soldier are pretty frightening. <laughs> All right, so first thing, I'm going to get this out of the way. Let's go, dude! Come on, man. I, look, I, unlike most people, I, I like Defran. Like, I, he, he had his problems. He, what he did was wrong, absolutely. Like, I, I didn't support that. Like, if you go back and watch the shows, I was very upset with that because I, I liked Defran. Like, I liked, you know, the rest of his personality. But since then, we've, we've learned that there were some problems and obviously he had some issues and all of that stuff. So I feel like he's, he's learned from then, hopefully, and hopefully he gets a, small amount the the exact right amount of pressure because i feel like if too much pressure is put on him we may get throw for defran again so i'm a little worried about that but i if he as long as long as he has a support structure behind him i i think he will be good because like you said with the soldier changes um and if you've watched any of his stream he he still enjoys overwatch like he he definitely hops between games but he's still very good at overwatch and he's expanded his hero pool now whether or not that actually translates off the ladder back into pro play we'll have to wait it be seen but he's he's a phenomenally talented player and he he is actually pretty charismatic when he's not being a douchebag um so he he, see, to me, he's kind of like the the opposite of XQC. Like, XQC never wanted that that redemption arc. Like, he's basically just still XQC. Like, the, the only way he's still on the World Cup team right now is because he had to, like, mute the game. Like, he basically muted his whole team. Whereas Defran is, like, encouraging people. You know, he, he gets a little tilted from time, but throw from Defran hasn't made a return. So I, I think this is a very big signing, especially uh, going into the new patch. Now, whether Soldier continues his dominance, you know, like I said, PTR patch can go either way, hopefully. Uh, but assuming Blizzard sticks with its track record and Soldier goes live how he is on the PTR, uh, AKM and Defran are going to be in a pretty happy place in Season 2 if they're both playing. So... Uh, I, I'm excited for Dufresne. I think he's he's a big pickup. He he has a little bit of star power, whether you know it because you saw him in Selfless or because of the infamy that he generated outside of, you know, the pro scene. I, I think it's just a good pickup all around. And I am I am ready for him to get back in the league because I think the league needs more big personalities that can be somewhat controversial without, you know, stepping over that line. Because in season one, we got to see a lot of that, but they all stepped over the line, some so, more so than others, uh, like XQC and uh, that guy who played for Boston, who I, I'm not going to name. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm excited for Dufresne. I, I, I still enjoy him, and he's he's a phenomenal player. So it's if, if he does go to one of these expansion teams, that's already going to knock them up at least three rankings for me. Yeah, I'm <clears throat> I'm of two minds here. One, you know, I, I enjoy Defran as a player. You know, his tracking uh, is definitely <clears throat> one of the best uh, in regards to, like, just kind of like the player pool. Um, but the other part of me is like, well, can you really rely on someone that would rather just throw your career away to go flip burgers at mcdonald's like you know it's it, it's so hard to say because you know there there was a time where you know you know he was just like i'm trying to remember what exactly his uh what his suspension note was that he wrote after the fact but it was uh it definitely changed a lot of viewpoints uh to him as a player uh but you know i i feel like there's been enough of a period where no, there, there's been, like, a cooling off process, I think would be the best way to describe it. So I feel like enough time has passed where, you know, a lot more people would be open for someone like the friend to get a second chance. Now, whether or not that's going to happen, you know, obviously this is still, you know, heavily rumored, remains to be seen. But I, I want to see the friend back in the league. I want to see him compete on that level again because uh, it would be an absolute waste, you know, if he wasn't given that chance just because, you know, he was easily a top five player in na at that time and i feel like he still has a story to be told uh so 
No, I I feel like as long as he uh He's done his time. He's <laughs> done his time. As long as as long as he he you know skirts that line or just, you know, plays nice, I think he'll be fine. As long as he has the support that he needs. Exactly. You know, I, I, I don't see there's any reason why he would uh get past that line that's drawn in the sand. Uh so we're going to keep our, you know, ears to the ground, see, you know, what sort sort of rumors are going to surface and what come to fruition. But, uh, you know, this could be a potentially massive sign in for the Atlanta airports. And, you know, <laughs> what bugs me more than anything is the fact that Slambo didn't even put us in the know about this. You know, we found out by our own means on Twitter, as per usual, and Slambo's just <sighs> dropping a ball again, not being here. Oh, well. <sighs> He's probably too busy, you know, negotiating with the Fran for that six six figure salary. Absolutely. Ah, uh, but anyways, guys, let's go ahead and let's jump into our main discussion for this week, which will be the Overwatch World Cup Paris group stage. So again, we had three days of action, and this was the final group stage uh, before you know the BlizzCon stage, which would be the top eight. So we kicked things off on Friday, September twenty first. And we saw France defeat Netherlands 4-0. We saw United Kingdom defeat Germany 3-1. Italy defeated Poland 3-2. Netherlands defeated Germany 3-1. And then the United Kingdom finished off the day by defeating Poland 4-0. So, Spider, that would bring us into day two on Saturday. So what went down then? So France defeated Germany 3-2. The Netherlands defeated Italy 3-1. Germany defeated Poland in a very close 3-2. France absolutely destroyed Italy four to zero. That one was not even close. Uh, and then you, the UK, defeated the Netherlands four to zero. Which would bring us to day three. So kicking off on Sunday, we saw Germany defeat Italy three to one. France defeated Poland four to zero. United Kingdom defeated Italy four to zero. Netherlands defeated Poland four to zero. And then to determine the top seed. Uh, in this group stage, we saw France defeat United Kingdom four to zero. Oof! Oof. So that's a that's a hard hard pill to swallow. My boys uh, getting getting swept there. Ah, uh, but either way, like you know, France and United Kingdom were definitely the heavy favorites uh, going into this mm -hmm. group stage, and both of the teams did advance to BlizzCon. And of course, we do have our top eight. We'll go through the bracket uh, after we do our analysis, enter standout players, marquee matches, all that good stuff. Uh, so, you know, obviously I had a ton of stuff going on. So out of all of the group stages, this is the one I caught the least of. So, mm -hmm. Spider, I know you caught a little bit more than I did. Uh, but what other matches that you saw would you uh, say are worth taking a look at? So even though it was a, a sweep, it was a pretty close sweep. I would definitely watch France versus UK. It was it was closer than the 4-0 would let you believe. Uh, granted, France did win it pretty handily, but it... It's worth a watch. Uh, Germany versus Poland is actually very good. Uh, the Germany team really surprised me. And just continuing that, Germany versus UK, if you want to see UK do it. Um, but obviously, the the biggest match was Germany versus France. Like, that was, I think, the closest match of the weekend. So, I if you're going to watch one match, I would probably say UK versus France. Just because then you get to see who's going into BlizzCon. But I would highly advise watching two matches, UK versus France, and then France versus Germany. Absolutely. So, you know, standout players across the teams for me. Uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed Kranks, the DPS for Germany, outside of the Genji. His Genji had a lot of issues. Uh, a lot of Dragon Blades that uh, either got booped away or, you know, hacked mid-blade or... You know, just not in any position to really get any value. Uh, his other hero looked fantastic. Genji, not so much. Mm. Um, but if you're talking about Germany, the standout, without question, is Kodak, their support player. Uh, this is someone that is rumored to be linked to one of these uh, expansion teams. Uh, so this could be someone that we could be seeing Overwatch League soon. And he had a moment in that France versus Germany game on Route 66. Uh, in the time bank where he just opens up with a 5k on Zenyatta. Like, what? Yeah. How? That That is just, that is shit that you just never see in Overwatch. Like, he just completely frags out. Like, it's absolutely 
you know, no big deal. Just a casual 5K with the with the flex support. Jake, um, Jake dropping the Kodak moment. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, he. <laughs> most of Germany was a standout for me. Um, so a couple of my standouts were Vazility from Netherlands. He he really surprised me. Uh, Netherlands as a whole looked a little lost, but he he was a pretty good standout. So I feel like we'll see more of him. Uh, you know, you already mentioned Kodak. I think uh, I think it's Meaty from Germany, or Meti from Germany. Okay. The, yeah, the the off tank. Uh, he looked f- pretty good. And then Nesh, I I expected a lot from Nesh, and he he provided just because I've seen him play before. Uh, Christopher, yeah, his, uh, his Zarya was mm. absolutely phenomenal, just cutting through people. Mm-hmm. That's basically what made their their goats comp work because he was at a hundred percent energy a hundred percent of the time, uh, but yeah, Christopher, I I was happy to see him step up and perform because he was the one I was really hoping for. Would uh, he basically performed in every match except for France? Like France kind of walked over him, but other than that, you know, beyond that, you know, the whole French roster wins did really good uh i didn't see any tweets from the payload so he could have did a little bit better <laughs> but uh ben best surprised me like he mm-hmm. he was you know i i've seen him play a little bit but honestly like when he came out swinging i was very surprised how well he did uh, what about you any anybody i missed anybody else um i i have to give a nod to cruz from the united kingdom the support player um so something that cruz does that i feel like a lot of supports that don't do is Cruz as a Lucio does a very damn good job at protecting his other healer, especially when it comes to, mm-hmm. you know, the Genji's coming in with the Dragon Blade. He's always there to, you know, get the boop, create that separation, or, you know, at times, you know, go aggro Lucio. And, you know, that's not something we get to see a whole lot of on that role. So uh, for me, like, Playing that like more babysitter type role when it comes to dealing with the Genjis kind of puts him above a lot of other support players for me. Um, other than that, you know, I was pretty impressed with uh, Brussen from the Netherlands, their flex tank, mm-hmm. uh, and Donye, Poland's uh, DPS player, showed a lot of good stuff this past weekend as well. Uh, but for me, you know, Kodak was definitely the standout player for me, uh, just across the board. And you know, I just I love seeing these support players just being able to uh, just turn the fights like. It seemed like in that series against France, he either had a transcendence up that kept, you know, Germany in the fight, or, you know, mm-hmm. he would just frag out or go on the flank and, you know, create that uh, diversion for their front line to win the battle. So a lot of good stuff across the board. Uh, but, you know, the players that I expected to perform basically did what I expected. Uh, but there really weren't too many big surprises out of the lot. No, I mean... We, we talked about it last week. Like, we expected France and UK to be the top two pretty handily. And, you know, that's that's exactly how it ended up. So, uh, I I can't break it down any more than that. Sorry. <laughs> they, they, Italy, I, I wasn't impressed with. Like, I, sorry, Italy. Like, just, I didn't see anything noteworthy. Uh, Poland had its moments. Netherlands ha- had its moments. Uh, but... Germany, France, and UK were definitely the the three standouts. And you know, f- France, their their compositions surprised me. Like the way they they integrated soon AKM uh, and Nico actually pretty like s- surprised me that they would put um, soon on Brigida and AKM on the Zarya. Like that that wasn't the combination I expected. Like for some reason I expected you know uh nico to play the brigida but i don't know that's just just how it worked out and the what was it i think it was against netherlands maybe it was poland but it was france on anubis where soon basically with mercy uh (laughs) spawn camped them Mm -hmm. like just like to the t like he would not let them out of the hangar like they literally killed him once, and that's because they they random switched to Widow. It shot him from the back of the hangar, so he couldn't even see the Widow. And then he just got rezzed, and they just continued it. And you know, a lot of people were like crapping on AKM because AKM generated like a two and a half minute rip tire, but which won them the game. It did. <laughs> they were like AFK on the point. But 
You can't generate a rip tire as Junkrat if the enemy team is dead. Like yeah. that wasn't. Like they're they're in the spawn the entire game. What do you what the hell do you think you're gonna do? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that that was phenomenal. Definitely go watch at least the the opening round of that because soon just puts on a clinic. Like it it was almost borderline sad to watch. Like they just had no answer to it. Absolutely, and uh, it was definitely thing of beauty. We don't we don't normally get to see Widow just uh, go into town like that, especially on that map. Uh, but, you know, I have to say, like, the French crowd was, uh, was pretty, pretty noticeable, I would say, when it comes to the Very broadcast. Very loud. You could definitely hear, uh, how loud that audience was, and, uh, you know, that definitely helped elevate France's game just a little bit. Uh, but, man, you know, I have to say, like... I feel like every year when it comes to the World Cup, when it comes to, you know, these European group stages, I, I feel like Blizzard is still underestimating, like, how many seats they'll be able to fill or how many jerseys they're going to be mm -hmm. able to sell for, like, the France World Cup team because they did sell out uh, in both cases. So hopefully next year, you know, they'll get a more uh, better suited venue uh, <laughs> for them. But that being said, like, the prior year, like... The studio that they were in i can't remember what location they were at but it was like there tiny. were maybe a couple hundred seats it was if tiny that, it was really bad so at least it was an improvement but it's still not enough to fit the needs uh for that group yeah i mean i i would like to hope that in the future world cup is a a very big deal like they're they're putting them in stadiums and stuff like we saw for the finals even just for you know the the group stages because i think overwatch can get there especially if overwatch league continues its you know positive trajectory but yeah I, you know i watching it this weekend made me very sad that i won't be going to blizzcon because all all the matches that i watched outside of a very specific few i was very excited to watch for this world cup um and i hate to say it but most of the few that i didn't care about were the ones from this last group stage so but uh it's it, blizzard has been doing very good with um the production quality of this world cup like we kind of got the taste of it at the end of the last world cup and i i feel like they're they're generating the right amount of hype during the event like i think they they still need to advertise it a hell of a lot more like they need to basically plaster it on the walls and stuff so they start generating more viewership for it but i think in game like in the actual um like watching it i think has gotten very good outside of the time that they lost the in-game camera and they had to basically <laughs> watch the game over uh one of the players shoulders which if you haven't seen that it's one of the top twitch clips but yeah, World Cup has has been very exciting, and with the announcement of the matchups at BlizzCon, I am just like racking my brain. Like I don't know who to like. Uh, okay, obviously one of the matches I know who to pick, but outside of that, I'm like, oh man, these these can be close for so many different reasons. Yes, and I we can only hope that this year Slambo will not get an undefeated bracket because that was some bullshit last year. <laughs> <laughs> I I never win. I don't I don't I don't whatever. I'm not gonna win I it anyway. It, I, I guess it's different because I'm I'm just in a different position. <laughs> yeah, he, it's but very anyway, different from the runner up to uh, you know the Shanghai level of predictions. Right. Like, <laughs> he, how did you pick Japan? Japan's not even in it. I don't know. I thought they'd make a comeback. <laughs> absolutely well maybe you just thought china wouldn't get their visas so you know they're just like oh let's just send japan or i guess in this case you know maybe it should have been russia since they were one of the better teams that didn't make the cut you mean that's besides the shadow point. point shadow burn yeah shadow burn you know just send him yeah <laughs> 1v6 yeah <laughs> all right but anyways let's go ahead and let's move match analysis which was france versus germany this was featured on day two of this group stage of the overwatch world cup so we kick things off on oasis and you know france as per usual uh you know no surprise eu likes tanks uh so there was a lot of triple tank triple support ton of goats on both sides of the field uh but we saw the Farah and mccree coming out from germany France does get positional advantage running goats, and Progi falls early, giving France the initial capture. 
We see Kranks opening things up for Germany with the 2k barrage, which was paired with the Graviton Surge, and that allowed Germany to flip the point at 33%. Ben Bess ends up blocking Progi Shatter, and Germany give up control of the point. I even invested a Transcendence in the process. So, France has an alt economy advantage. Um, they end up canceling out Nesha's Deadeye when Poco uh, just uses his boosters, gets right in his face, uh, so no value to that. Uh, especially with the uh, the pushback from the boosters. And then Poco comes in, finds two with the self-destruct to close out the round for France. So moving into round two, we saw France getting first control again. Uh, and, you know, we saw some early swaps to run goats for Germany. And Germany ends up bringing it back as Ben Best is the first to fall and soon ends up getting caught by a fire strike. So Germany ends up turning up the aggression off of the max charge of Nesha's Zarya, which uh, was definitely one of the standout things for Germany uh, with their GOATS composition, as we mentioned. Uh, Mete ends up finding two and the DMEC with the self-destruct, and Unco is unable to keep France alive with the Transcendence. Soon ends up getting too far out, and Germany are the aggressors yet again. They end up pushing France back to spawn. Uh, we do see some shatters getting blocked on both sides, Pragi being the first to fall. And Nesh ends up getting pinned, which allows France to flip the point. We see Mete's Diva getting staggered bad here, and this is where France catches the front line with the Graviton Surge to secure the next fight. And Cranks ends up getting isolated by soon, and AKM has the follow through with the Graviton Surge to secure the map for France to give them the 1 0 lead. Yeah, so, I mean, the first map was basically Goats versus Goats, and France out Goats to them. Uh, it it was it was a brawl like that that's all it was and and France just positioned better and you know it went back and forth a few times but overall France looked pretty dominant that first round the second round was actually really interesting because a lot of times France was fighting from a deficit like they would go down a player really early and then fight back and actually win it there were a lot of fights that teams traditionally would back off from but France just use their aggression to keep the pressure on. And even though they would lose fights here and there, they would generate their alts to the point where they would just come in and, and take it back. So if you, if you really want to see like a good, uh, I don't want to say, I don't want to say like a good teaching moment, but if you want to see how to play like a man down in overwatch, this is a great round to watch because just the way they position, just the way that they, they would bait Germany into certain areas to fight you know 5v6 was actually very interesting like this out of all the out of all the maps this was probably one of my favorites outside of route 66 because of the the wackiness that went on there <laughs> but uh yeah this this was very weird overwatch to me like this wasn't like round one where it was goats versus goats and it was just teams slamming into each other like this was a, a very heavily position based battle which you don't see a lot with goats like goats you just slam into each other and like I said, it, the fight dictates where they go, but you could very clearly see how France was thinking, like, we're going to pull them back to this choke, or we're going to move them here, and, you know, and there were lots of times when, like you said, uh, Cranks would get isolated because he wouldn't keep up with his team. Like, he, he just wouldn't make the the right rotation and stuff like that, and, and soon an AKM would punish him, and that's eventually how they lost the map. So this is, this is actually a very cool map to watch, like, uh, Oasis can go one of two ways. Oasis can either just be like a brawl forever, or it can actually be a really interesting like uh, thought process to see how teams you know position. Or it can go a third way, which is the London Spitfire way, which you just don't know what they're gonna run, and it becomes like a May, you know, Reaper show. But <laughs> this this was a fun match to watch. Like I, I really enjoyed Oasis, and I I I don't normally enjoy Oasis, so. Well, that would bring us to map two, which was played on Nubani. Uh, Germany was on the attack first. Uh, so France, on their defense, opted to run Anna and Soldier. Uh, for Germany, they were running the Sombra Genji dive. So Kranks is struggling early on to find the angles with the Genji. It ends up being the first to fall uh, in the first couple of attempts for Germany. Uh, so, you know, the stout, you know, France defense doing pretty good early on. Uh, soon ends up dropping the EMP as Germany's tank line falls. Uh, we see Cranks coming in with the Dragon Blade, but ends up getting shut down by, you know, the Grandma Goggles, you know, the Nano Visor. <laughs> uh, in other words, if people don't know their terminology, uh, that's that's taking, taking it back a while, because uh, 
that mm -hmm. was the old name that they would use. Uh, so Francis holding on to their tank ultimates. Uh, they end up pressuring down Progi a lot. So, you know, that, that was one of the key things I, I feel like in this series. Pro when you look at the main tank battle, Progi was definitely getting pressured more than Ben Best throughout this entire series. And a lot of it was just off just off of the back of the aggression of France. So definitely I was making Progi like backpedal quite a bit and just be overall tentative uh, throughout the series, which would definitely come into play throughout multiple maps in this series. Uh, so Germany's attack really struggled early on. They had about 30 seconds left on the attack. Uh, Mete ends up uh, fa falling, going for it, self-destruct, but he does manage to find both Akium uh, and Unka with that. So Krings comes in, he draws the Dragon Blade, and that ends up pushing France off of the point, which allows Germany to secure uh, that first objective in overtime. So we see some swaps coming out. France ends up swapping to Goats. We see Germany bringing out the Doomfist. <laughs> uh, Germany end up forcing a sound barrier and take the fight, but France have more than enough time to recontest here. Ben Best ends up getting isolated and gets dropped as he looks for an Earth Shatter. And then Nesh finds five with the EMP, and we start to see the team straighten out here. France ends up clearing a cart with a counter Graviton Surge, and France uh, has both of their support alts at the ready, which they use to endure and just secure the hold on defense. Uh, so, moving on to the France attack, uh, we see Somber Genji on both sides. Uh, so, you know, a lot of scouting being done uh, with the Sombers here. Germany end up getting pushed off the high ground as France gets the first tick. Uh, we see the side starting to trade out, but Germany's double main support comp is helping them, uh, you know, stay sustained. They run in Anna and Mercy uh, for this one. Uh, we see AKM pulling out the blade, ends up finding Progi, and Germany look to maintain, uh, maintain control by nano boosting Mete's Diva. So really not the normal, like, priority target when it comes mm. to nano boost. Uh, so Germany end up over invest in their ultimates uh, which gives france the ultimate advantage advantage here akim ends up finding both supports on a high ground and that allows france to secure that first objective uh so you know moving on to some of the next fights we see akim trying to turn uh, a losing fight in france's favor ends up finding both supports with a dragon blade uh and this was despite him being hacked by the sombra mm -hmm. mete ends up getting staggered when soon drops emp uh, Froki finds Unko in the back line, and Mete is just looking to swing around and stall with the Hammond, because, uh, you know, time is running low here. AKM ends up finding two with one slice of the Dragon Blade, and that's enough to close out the map for France. So France, they own a half time with a 2-0 to zero lead, which would uh, be kind of short-lived, because Germany would bring this one back. Yeah, I mean, this... This was actually a, a pretty fun round to watch. Uh, I'm going to actually say that for all of these, probably. Uh, I'll try not to. But uh, I, I love watching the 76 defense just because that's the defense I personally like to run because I played a lot of 76 when he was meta, and I still play a lot of 76, and I will continue to play 76 if you follow the PTR. But I, I really like this defense because it, it is so hard to break, and... I can't help but to think that had Mete not found both of them with that bomb, that they would have full held. Like there, because the the problem was he he hit Unko and uh, AKM, and they were setting up for another Grandma goggles. Like they were setting up for another Nano Visor, and AKM had just hit Tac Visor when that bomb landed on his face. So. It it may have been a not a much different story, but it may have been a very short story, uh, you know, compared to what we got. But overall, it it was fun to watch them do that on defense and their offense. Um, their offense didn't wow me. Like it was just very much, you know, hack counter hack. You know, just dive the hack target. So they they didn't do anything special. So. What I really want to touch on is the the brawl at the end, and this this is actually really going to come into play for Route 66 as well, is when they get to payload sections of the map, France might be the best at just drawing those sections out way longer than any team. Like, they just would get on the, the cart and fight and, you know, screw around for a little bit and then leave, 
you know, they'd lose one or two and then they leave and then they would re-engage like super fast. And what that does is it just draws the map out so long. So even though they're getting cart push and they're not technically winning team fights, they're making it take so long. And that's actually what allowed them to stop them before the second point is um, not only did they stall them out really well on the first point, but they stalled them out the whole second section. Like they would get on and, and contest in that that to France's credit, that is phenomenal that they were able to do that because most teams don't have the discipline to get in and fight like that. So, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring that up again on route 66, but they did that here. And that, I think that's what got them the map win here is because when they went on offense, their offense wasn't anything special. They just didn't have a lot of offense that they needed to get the job done. So uh, I think that's, I think their defense really won it for them. Yeah, so uh, Germany would bring this series back by winning the next two maps, both of which would go to Time Bank. Uh, so map three, we went to Volskaya. Uh, so, you know, we saw a lot of uh, a lot of Nico on the Genji, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of value out of the Dragon Blades, which is nice to see. Uh, you know, the defensive Genji in this case for France. Uh, and, you know, I'm not going to really, like, go through the initial attacks just because they both finished in really good times. Uh, Germany did finish with 3.14 left in the in the time bake. Uh, France ended up finishing their attack with 3.43. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Nico had a pretty key pick on Nesh's Brigitte, which really opened up uh, that two-man advantage, two advantage uh, which allowed, you know, France to complete their map. Uh, and, you know... I'll say they had a dragon strike that just kind of like split the team as well, which definitely helped them finish it out. Uh, but going into the time bank rounds, uh, so Germany were on the attack first. Uh, both of the teams were running these uh, somber Genji dives, and early on the teams were trading early, and Germany ends up finding both the support players. Germany looks to snowball uh, this attack because they have five ultimates in their economy. Dude ends up dropping the EMP, and Nico is there. Uh, he ends up getting a 4k with just the dash reset, so a lot of value from the Genji there, uh, even outside of the Dragon Blade. Cranks ends up falling early, uh, which forces Germany to go for a soft reset. Uh, Mete ends up finding Unko with a self-destruct, and then the barrier is up, but it gets negated by the EMP. Uh, so we see Germany coming in uh, to re-engage. They end up securing two ticks, but soon comes in with the emergency Doomfist. Uh, you know, just looking to stall things out. Germany ends up clearing the point uh, and end up completing the map in overtime. So hmm. that's a pretty pretty tall order one way or another, completing, you know, a second attack, essentially. Uh, so France knew what their condition was. They need to, you know, at least complete uh, to, you know, get the draw or, you know, maybe get some uh, time banks still left. So we see a Ben Best drop in early, uh, but Poco is able to bring the fight back getting a 2k for France, but the kills are enough for uh, France to win the engage and secure the first point, so uh, pretty pretty clean execution early on. So soon at this point, uh, even before they got the first capture, you know, he was on the Sombra, and he was already making his way towards the second point, uh, and the reason he's doing this is because he wants to get, you know, that big health pack hacked, so, you know, the Germany defense isn't able to use it. That's not something we actually get to see a whole lot, so I was happy to see them taking that sort of approach. And of course, mm -hmm. you know, he's getting early scouting in for his team, uh, which, you know, is one of Sombra's key roles right now in her current iteration. Uh, so we see Unko fall into a self-destruct, which ends up forcing France to go for a full reset. Progi ends up creating some space with the 2k, and France is just getting pressured uh, with the Dragon Blade. So... Germany end up over-investing. Uh, at the time, they had three ultimates in their economy. Uh, they end up using all of them in the next fight. So Ben Best comes in with the Primal Rage. He gets slapped behind the points, and we see Nesh drop an EMP, and then the cleanup is there off the back of Krinx's Dragon Blade to complete the second point hold for Germany. I mean, when you, when you watch this map, you can see why Germany picked it. They just seemed more practiced on it. They just seemed to know the routes. They knew the somber routes. Like they, they. It, it's hard for me to accentuate just how differently uh, Nesh and Cranks moved through this map compared to Nico. I uh, did just it. 
it's hard to describe just because they they were running mirror comps for most of it so you got to see genji's you know flip around do do all the cyber ninja stuff but they were in very different positions and nesh just seemed to know where he needed to be and i don't want to downplay nico nico actually did very well this map especially mm -hmm. coming in cold because this was his first map but it just seemed like as a whole the team the german team knew i guess just better how to position um i'm trying to think if yeah so honestly that that's what it came down to for me the the one thing i will say is it seemed like the france tanks were a little more aggressive than they wanted to be like the rest of the team wanted to be because there were multiple times like especially at the end um where ben best got caught out behind the point there were multiple times where that happened like tanks would drop first or ben best would drop first uh poco would be caught out of position and get demeked really early it it was just a strange map for me because everything we saw France do prior to this didn't really point to why they played the the second attack the way they did. It, it just didn't fall with basically what they've generated as their MO up to this point. So I was pretty confused to see them do it this way. So I don't know if they're just not practiced on Volskaya or what, or just at that point, Germany had figured them out on Volskaya and just knew how to counter maneuver around them. I'd have to go back and really watch to see like um, the, the key thing for this is the Sombra versus Sombra. Like if, if you see one Sombra know where the other Sombra is, that's, that's just a key indicator that the teams are more practiced on it. Like they know what to expect and the other team, the the less practiced team, doesn't understand that the the enemy team knows this. So it, it's it's an interesting dynamic to think of. And Sombra v Sombra is really weird because there's a lot of mind games and stuff that goes on. And this was a fun map to watch for that. Like you said, you, you mentioned rushing forward to try to counter hack that health pack. Uh, and he actually didn't get it like they had already hacked it. So that just kind of reinforces my point like they knew what to expect so they were like all right we need to grab this health pack right now like screw it i'm out of here type of thing um but it, it was good for germany this is what germany needed because even though it was fairly close like it was four to three germany looked pretty pretty dominant on this at points like other than a few like key plays from france like there was basically france has a few clutch moments but overall i think germany up until you know their their point B attack the second time, were pretty consistent. Like like you said, they both finished pretty quickly the first time, so it it was an interesting map to watch. I I would watch it from the perspective of watching the Sombras. Like I wish they would have did more with the Sombras, but uh, it's you know it's fun. It's a fun map to watch. I I think the next one is the best map to watch by far. So. Uh, let's talk about that one. That one's more fun. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, map 4 was played on Route 66, and uh, yeah, by far this was uh, my favorite map that I did catch this past weekend. Uh, so this one, again, as I mentioned, did go into the time pick rounds, and uh, you know, that's when we did have our Kodak moment. Uh, <laughs> so Germany were on the attack first, and speaking of Kodak, uh, you know, he was going up, uh, you know, Germany on the attack, he was going up the ramp on the left-hand side uh, through the train, Mm -hmm. And he was on Anna, and he's like, boop, Bionade right onto the carts, because uh, France was playing pretty aggressively on their defense. So uh, Kodak gets a huge Bionade to kick things off. And this is where Nesh's Zarya really starts to come into play uh, with the GOATS count for Germany. He has high energy. He just cuts right through France early on. Uh, and, you know, after that first... Uh, you know, first brawl, really, with Nesh winning it on the Zarya. Like, they just breeze right to the first objective. Uh, so, going into the second phase of the map, we do see the two teams ending up swapping positions. So, you know, the defense was normally where the attack would be. The attack was normally where the defense would be. Uh, ben Bess ends up looking for a shatter, but that doesn't get the follow-through that France needs. Germany end up finding two off the self-destruct, and Proki's aggression ends up forcing France back. Uh, France, you know, continues to play forward with their defense, so they're really making Germany work for every inch, you know, which is something that we brought up. Uh, you know, Germany's momentum uh, was continuing as Procky dropped the Shatter, ends up finding three in the process. 
But Onko, being the sneaky Zenyatta that he is, is kind of like all to the side, still contested, and Germany doesn't notice right away, uh, which is pretty <laughs> funny. Because, you know, it's not something that you normally expect, you know? It's not like uh, Zenyatta's, like, in stealth or anything. Been here all along. <laughs> right, I guess it's just the fact that he's floating, so you can't really hear his footsteps. I, I don't know, but, you know, you, got, you gotta be... Gotta be careful from those uh, cheeky flex supports. Ah, uh, but Mete ends up getting demeked as we head into overtime. We start to see the teams trading out, and Anko is keeping friends up uh, with the transcendence here. And then Nesh on the Zarya, you know, having that high energy, just cuts straight through France, and Germany ends up closing out the map. So this would bring us to France attack, and uh, you know, Poku starts off on the Hanzo. You know, he goes for the uh, the sonar arrow on the train, and, you know, Germany were going to be the aggressors looking for that sneaky train attack. That was completely ruined by Poco, so he had that scouted a mile away. Uh, and then Poco ends up continuing that by finding the first two pickoffs to open things up for France. France ends up using the Graviton Surge to catch Nesh out, uh, and that allows the snowball to continue for France. Nesh ends up coming back looking for a Graviton Surge, but it comes after France had already secured the objective, so, you know, too little, too late in that sense. Mm. Uh, so timing just a little bit off. Definitely wish he could have had that one back. Uh, so we see Germany look to re-engage, uh, only to get caught in the Graviton Surge. Soon at this point, it's just flailing away on the Brigitte, and France ends up cruising to the second objective. Uh, we do see, you know, some pretty good coordination from Germany's defense, you know, with the shield bash, self the short combo. Uh, so, you know, Ben Best gets targeted with the stuns here, uh, and that ends up resulting in a 3k for Mete. Poco ends up getting caught out, uh, and he isn't able to keep Ben Best alive with the Zarya barriers. We see Kodak get a key pickoff on soon, uh, which sends France packing with one minute left. So Germany looked to engage off the sun barrier, and they invest the Graviton, but Unko, you know, again, has a key transcendence, keeping France alive. And then the later ultimates swing the fight in favor for France as they complete the map in overtime. So, that will leave us to that Kodak moment. Germany on the attack. And it is Goats versus Goats, except Kodak, you know, he is on the Zenyatta. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just opens things up, gets a key pick on one of the supports. And in the first sequence of this map, he ends up securing a 5k on the first engage as in Yada. Like, I said, like, that's... You don't expect that to happen ever. Nope. Let alone as a flex support. Uh, so just absolutely crazy. Uh, so Kodak ends up investing a Transcendence in the next engage, uh, which, you know, keeps Germany in the thick of things. Kranks is flailing away at France, and Germany just cruises to the first objective, no problem. But, you know, just based off of the timing that they had, we're already in overtime. So Germany not able to really lose the cart for any moment because, you know, that wick is going to burn out if they even move, really. Uh, so, you know, things uh, start to look worse for wear for France. Poco is, you know, trying to look for a Graviton Surge to end it here. Mete comes in clutch with, you know, the defense matrix, ends up eating the Graviton Surge. And Kodak, again, you know... Yes, he had a transcendence. It did come out a little bit early, uh, but, you know, he kept his team in it. The sustain was there. Mete opened things up for Germany again, and then we see the Graviton coming in over the top from Nesh, and, you know, that was paired with Mete's self-destruct. That results in a 2k. Germany are already at the second objective at this point, and Kodak is now on the flank trying to get the key pickoffs. And, yes, he doesn't get any kills in that moment, but, you know... He's still landing the shots in, so he is weakening France on that flank route with the Zenyatta. Uh, but Ben Best comes in, and he just drops Germany with, like, a massive shatter, and that is enough to allow the Wick to burn out. But man, like, you know, we don't always see Zenyatta in, like, the Goats versus Goats matches. Mm -mm. Uh, so that was another thing that really made that moment stand out. You know, on top of it being a 5k, which, you know, you don't normally see. Uh, so, going to the France uh, time make attack. Poco got the opening pick on Progi. You know, a lot of that being just the aggression of the tank by just pressuring uh, Progi's shield down. Uh, so France ended up cruising towards the first objective. And, you know, Germany 
are looking kind of hesitant. They opt to not re-engage before, uh, you know, they were able to secure that first point. Because, you know, if they contested there and then, you know, they got wiped, that would just be a lot of progress in that second phase of the map. Mm -hmm. So, what does Germany do? Their defense looks to just control the doorway. Obviously, that doorway, uh, when it closes, you have very narrow entryways uh, to get to that payload. France ends up investing some ultimates in the next fight. Uh, Germany are just holding on to the ults that they have. So they're not wanting to invest anything too late. Or, you know, they want to have them up when they need them. Uh, so they have a very clear win condition because they just have to stop France really at any point. <laughs> uh, so in one fight. That's all you yeah, have to do. That's, that's all they need because they have no time. So Kodak ends up finding Unco early on, which was a key pick. Uh, and Germany looked to engage here. And then Poco ends up getting caught with a fire strike, and then the cleanup is there for Germany to force that map 5. But man, Route 66, you know, we don't always get to see it, let alone completed, because uh, there are a lot of times where we do see, uh, you know, that third point being the hardest one to contest in Overwatch. So just a crazy map overall. It was it was a phenomenal map for for multiple reasons. Even starting starting out the gate when Kodak hit what is essentially the whole team with a bio grenade, and just to give you an idea, Kodak generated nano boost in like fifty one seconds at the start of that map, which Anna generates nano boost pretty fast, but that's that's fast even for her, uh, and that basically is what essentially essentially got them the first point because they just rode that momentum but overall um the you can talk about kodak because kodak was by far the standout player of this map like they they would not have gotten nearly the amount of success on this map without him but i i do want to you know put a little bit of the spotlight on mede because he was just out playing nico on that diva like leaps and bounds like they weren't even in the same league and this this kind of goes back to nico like we saw nico play a lot of diva in overwatch league but he's clearly a much better dps player so i i feel like maybe outside of the goats comp which i will go into france's goats comp when we we talk about the upcoming matchups um i i feel like they may need uh, France may need some help in that department just because he was he was outplayed so heavily. And, you know, France has Poco, who is a phenomenal diva player. So when even when you compare them in in team, you know, it's it's very it's a very stark contrast. And you can definitely tell that Poco probably is the better Zarya and Zarya is a much more important role because, as they point out in this match, the current plan for goats to beat other goats comps is to solo grab the Zarya and just murder her. And then at that point, uh, just steamroll the rest of the fight. So Zarya is much more important than diva. But as we saw in this match, diva can, you know, if diva can eat those grabs, if diva can, you know, harass the back line, that can make a big difference. And diva is a very good tank in goats to take advantage of discord orb. Like, um, you know, the traditional GOATS comp is like Moira Lucio. Uh, but this Lucio Zenyatta brings a lot of stopping power. And Germany just took way more advantage of it than France. Which is funny because with Unko, you would think France would have the advantage on the Zenyatta. But Kodak said, nope, I'll show you how it's done. You know, people are going to be talking about me after this one. And we absolutely are. Okay. Uh, overall, I this was a phenomenal map like there there were standout plays from from almost everybody like poco had a lot of shining moments on zarya um nesh obviously had a lot of good moments as well uh i i just i just think it comes down to uh germany had that x factor like that that was it like like i said had kodak not opened up like he did this would have been a this could have been the end of the game like i feel like france employed their stall tactic strategy where they basically make them fight for every inch and you know by time they got to third point they were already in overtime like they were they're rounding that corner and then overtime started on that first initial push um that didn't work out so well on their second push because i i don't know what happened i don't know if just 
France got a little antsy or, or what, like that, that just comes down to discipline. Like they could have just banked six alts and stopped him midway through second point, uh, which is pretty much what you, you saw Germany do. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a great map. Like, like I said, you should watch this whole match, but this map was phenomenal for many reasons. Which would lead into the final map, map five being played on the Paul. So going back to control here. Uh, so we did see a lot of goats yet again, no surprise here. Uh, but Nesh is on the Sombra uh, for Germany, looking to get a little bit of disruption uh, against France. So France, you know, which has kind of been tradition, you know, they get positional advantage, end up securing the initial control of the point. Uh, Progi ends up going in too deep and gets punished for it. And then this is where France pushes through uh, with the coalescence, which sends Germany just packing. Uh, we see Germany make some changes, but, you know, these changes are pretty significant because they are already well behind in regard to the Brigitte Rally race. Uh, and they, you know, swap at least three players to different roles. Uh, so the alt economy is not looking so good. Uh, so France ends up finding key pickoffs with the Graviton, and Germany are just... They're trying to find the answers that they need, but it's an uphill battle. Uh, soon is the first to fall, and France's follow-through just isn't there following the Earth Shatter. And we see Germany heavily invest their ultimates in order to flip the point, but it takes them until 99% to flip the point. So I have to hold on for, you know, pretty much the rest of the map, you know, uh, you know, minute 40 seconds minimum. Uh, <laughs> Supoko ends up coming in. With the Graviton Surge, and Mete again ends up eating the Graviton Surge. So, you know, that po Poco versus Mete battle, Zarya v. Diva, was definitely in Mete's favor. Now, By four. in the end, uh, it was still, you know, France coming out on top, but, you know, that definitely did open up more opportunities for Germany, uh, you know, to gain control here. Uh, but that didn't happen. And a lot of that was just off of the fact that Ben Best with his Shatters. They were coming in pretty huge. Mm -hmm. uh, Unko ends up fragging out. He does find a 2k, uh, which allows France to regain control. We see France block the self-destruct attempt by Mete, and that ends up closing out the round. Uh, so, you know, France only needed one more round to take that top seed, and we move to Shrine for yet another GOATS battle. <laughs> uh, so Germany, again, end up given up the positioning early on against France. And a lot of that was just due to the fact that, again, you know, Proe was under so much pressure that he was constantly backpedaling or just being hesitant to engage. And if you're not able to engage, well, you're not able to get to the point. It's basically what it is. Uh, so France ends up getting the first Graviton Surge that allows them to secure the fight. And this is where they start to turn up that aggression. They are pushing Germany to the spawn. Uh, Progi ends up being the first to fall again in the next engage. And, you know, this was a weird moment because uh, Germany were on the right-hand side of the map. And rather than going for the quick reset and just falling off of the ledge on that side, they end up going towards the middle and then trying to retreat. And, of course, they get picked off one by one. They feed a ton of, uh, you know, alt charge to France. Uh, Mete, you know, he... He kind of risked it because he was near the spawn, you know, just chilling on the diva. Uh, luckily, you know, he was able to get healed up by the respawns from Germany. Uh, but that was a definitely a huge risk. And I, I don't understand why they just didn't, you know, do the suicide pact. I, I don't know what, what what the reason it was behind the call. It definitely felt weird to me. Uh, but we go into this next engage and France has every ultimate to work with in their economy. <laughs> Uh, Nico has to self-destruct, ends up finding Nesh, and then the follow-through is there for France to close it out. So, uh, definitely a strong performance by uh, the GOATs from France, but, you know, I just feel like when it came to the GOATs, we GOATs, especially on control, like, Germany was never in a position where they were in a better spot positioning-wise compared to France. France always had the better spot, the better setup, and then France and Germany was just never able to take control at that point. They couldn't wrestle it back from France. Uh, it kind of goes back to our conversation about Oasis. It was very much a positional battle that France was by far on top of. Uh, the I mean, the first map wasn't so much positional as composition-based. Like, 
it's hard to play a Sombra into Goats unless you're playing a very specific anti-Goats Sombra comp. And they, they weren't. Like, Germany just was not. They were they were running, like, a, you know, just not the anti-Goats comp. So they were at a compositional disadvantage initially, and that just put them so far behind that it was hard for them to come back. And then by the time they did, you know, France had to win one fight. So the, the first round was almost classic textbook control. Like, one team gets to 99, sits there and banks a bunch of ultimates, and then just wins. Uh, the second round... I don't know what happened with Germany because it it was very much France got super aggressive, which we've seen the whole night, and usually Germany stood up to that. But for some reason, Germany started backing down to it, and that's what led them to the inferior positioning, like you said. And you know, when you're when you're playing goats versus goats, or you know any variation of goats versus goats, whatever you want to consider it at this point. The the team that is being aggressive will always have the advantage over the less aggressive team. That's why goats isn't as favorable on defense is because you can't choose how and where to engage because it's very much hit them from an angle where they're their most like their weakest angle basically. Whereas on defense, you basically have to take it on the chin and fight through it, and that's what ended up happening here is France just kept being super aggressive you know they they would pick and choose where they wanted to fight even though they were on defense they were technically more offensive than germany was most of this map because they were they were taking fights in certain areas where you wouldn't normally take a fight or you would push to to fight in and they just banked a, banked ultimates because that's the other advantage of goats and that's why teams switch to goats in like what seems like random moments is goats doesn't depend on ultimates so much as other compositions. It's not like the double sniper or like the Zarya, um, Hanzo, you, you know, space jam. It's not like those goats is very much just brawl. If you get an ultimate, throw it out, hopefully get something and then move forward. And we, we saw France take a much better advantage of that in the second point to the point where it looked like Germany didn't, like it basically looked like Germany forgot how to play goats that second point. Like they forgot that it's a very aggressive composition. Like basically France would show up and they say, "All right, well let's reposition and we'll take this fight a different time." And then three of them would die and they say, "Okay, well we okay, now we have to fight a different time." And France would just continually bank the ultimates. So this was my least favorite map because it was so one-sided, but if you want to see why goats works and why goats doesn't work, this is a very good map to watch for. <laughs> definitely a good uh, learning tool experience yes. uh, on both sides of the field there. Uh, so anyways, this was the final group stage of the Overwatch World Cup, which means, you know, we have our top eight for BlizzCon, and of course we had to get the bracket draw. Dun, 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 dun. So, looking at the left side of the field, we have France going up against Canada. We have China going up against Finland. And then on the right side, we have Team USA going up against the United Kingdom and South Korea will be going up against Australia. Okay, so first up, you know, we, we don't have to worry about South Korea in the quarterfinals just because both of us were, you know, top seeds in our group stages. So, you know, that's that's one sigh of relief, you know, at least, you know, we can make the semis. But either way, like, no matter how the brackets are, for a lot of us, the real finals is going to be USA versus South Korea. Just because of uh, the whole, you know, Korea versus the world factor. Plus, you know, it's the home crowd for USA. So there's going to be a lot on the line here. So I want to get your initial predictions because, you know, obviously, like, we're fresh off the minds of, you know, these group stages. And, of course, a lot of things can change leading up to BlizzCon. Uh, but, you know, on one side of the field, you have what is, uh, you know, probably two of the closest quarterfinals. And then on the other side, you know, maybe a little bit more one-sided uh, in regards to, you know, what we expect the results to be. But Spider, who are you favoring in these quarterfinal matches? And, you know, we'll go on from there. All right. So I'm going to I'm going to wuss out on the first one because I can't give an answer because I don't know what patch we're going to play on at BlizzCon. <laughs> so if we're if we're going to play on the 
the patch that is on the PTR right now, which I highly, I highly doubt. But if for some reason they decide to play on that patch, because I assume that patch will be live by BlizzCon, um, mm-hmm. I would say France over Canada just because of the soldier buff. Like, 100% purely because of the soldier buff. Uh, but the my more likely pick is I'm going to say Canada over France, just because France seemed to lean back on that GOATS comp super heavily. And they didn't look the best on it. Like, there were other teams that didn't rely on it as a crutch and pulled it off better. And that's saying something because uh, the, the 303 comp is not hard to play. It's just you run into the other team and, and swing at them. But I think I think Canada, outside of the soldier, has the advantage for that one. Uh, and then um, for China versus Finland, I am... Out of all these matches, this is the one I'm personally most excited for mm-hmm. because I want to watch Lee versus Taimu on McCree. Like, I, you can see the smile in my face. Like, <laughs> I, and if you're in audio, I'm sorry, but I'm smiling uh, because that is going to be a phenomenal battle. Because I, even if Finland is like, we don't really need to run McCree, or, you know, we're not planning on running McCree, as soon as Taimu sees that McCree come out, I can't help but to think, like, all right, we need we need to go McCree so I can try to out McCree him. Like that's just how Taimu is. Like he's like, oh, you want to play Widow? Well, I'll I'll play Widow and I'll try to out Widow you. Uh, it doesn't always happen as we saw in season one of Overwatch League, but I I have to feel like that's going to be a phenomenal match. Uh, I am giving the edge to Finland just because as good as China looked, I feel like Finland just had a much more rounded team like i feel like china fell back on that mccree comp a little more than they could have and i'm interested to see how china really falls into teams that can run goats can run dive can run you know a variety of compositions so um usa versus united kingdom usa like there was nothing as as good as united kingdom looked there's nothing you uk showed me that makes me believe that they can beat usa especially since usa has turned my thoughts around on raucous since he's been playing anna Mm -hmm. um south korea versus australia rip australia like i was excited to see australia play until they drew south korea and then i'm like (laughs) sorry custa but you're going home early like we did last year Mm -hmm. yeah for me like you know i think we're pretty much in agreement here um I, I am going to pick France over Canada, regardless of what patch we're on, for one sole reason. And that is because, you know, Jane, the, the head coach for Canada, is so anti-GOATS that I want to see a team that relies on GOATS just just beat Canada. Like, I... that, that's the only reason why I want to root, root for France in this case. Now, that being said, do I think Canada will more than likely win it? Yes, but I am still rooted for France just because, you know, it is it is still mostly rogue. And, you know, I I was very impressed with what I saw from uh, AKM and Nico even when he was coming in cold. Uh, mm-hmm. But yes, am I worried about, you know, some of their 303 looks with Nico in the fold? Absolutely. Uh, but I feel like if they can keep scrimming uh, against you know, Eagle game in, but that'll definitely put him in a better position. And, uh, you know, if you do get that soldier patch, you know, AKM can finally, uh, come to fruition with, uh, the prophecy that he has with, uh, soldier 76 and you no, know, the nano visors oh, were boy. definitely in full swing for them. Yeah. Uh, so moving on, we have Finland and China. Uh, this one is definitely going to be, the closest quarterfinal, bar none. Um, I, I am an avid fan of China. You know, we saw leave. Uh, you know, play like eleven different heroes, mm-hmm. and like no matter who is playing the McCree, I'm definitely looking forward to that. Uh, that Dead Eye battle, regardless of who's on it for China. Obviously, they have three McCree players on that lineup. Leave probably being the best one out of the lot. Uh, but for me, like, this one is definitely going to come down to, 
Like, China was always good at adapting to what these other teams were running in their group stage. The problem was, like, they were giving up a lot of maps to what a lot of us would perceive to be lesser teams. Are they going to be able to do the same thing against a team the caliber of, uh, of Finland? I, I don't know, but I expect to see a strong showing out of China either way. Uh, but I expect Finland to take it in uh, a very close series. Uh, USA versus United Kingdom, you know, I, I feel like United States is just going to throw too many looks at United Kingdom. You know, we've seen a lot of different approaches. Uh, yeah, some trolley compositions from the United States, but uh, they definitely kind of kind of force their will, uh, for lack of better words, uh, against a lot of these teams. And, you know, I, I'm not going to look past United Kingdom. Uh, you know, Cruz, I've been an avid fan of. They have a lot of members of Reunited. Uh, but I think U.S. will still come out on top. Uh, probably going to be one of the more one-sided affairs. And then, you know, Australia... <laughs> They they looked better than I was expecting given their current lineup, uh, but you know I I still think South Korea is going to come out on top. Uh, you know there's still a lot of question marks about how good South Korea is, and you know how they're going to look, and who's going to be playing what role. And well, they lost a lot of maps last year, and you know this is the closest you know the skill gap has been between the regions. Yes, that's true. But I, I still feel like Australia just isn't quite there yet. Uh, but, like, for me, like, maybe the only team that I could see Australia beat would probably be, like, France when you kind of, like, look at the top seeds. And even that would be kind of questionable. Uh, so I'm expecting it to be uh, Finland beating France in the semis. Uh, and, you know, it's... <laughs> I, I'm so torn on the United States versus, versus South Korea. Like, I, I want to choose the Scouting and the uh, the Sombra Doomfist of the United States. And uh, if that's the case, like, I expect a U.S. Finland final, but it's very hard to, uh, to count South Korea out one way or another. Yeah, definitely. I, I struggle with that one, too. I'm going to go USA over South Korea just out of pure national pride like there <laughs> there's no like analytic analytical basis for that uh just because honestly when we saw these two teams play both of them kind of screwed around most of the time mm -hmm. so i i'm curious to see what actually happens when we get to see them play because i i have to imagine that when they're in the quarterfinals we're gonna get to see like our first real look at them like the that's not a spot where you're gonna screw around and run torbjorn and stuff like that like the u.s did try the symmetra bastion offense which they may they may try it and then immediately change if it fails so i don't want to count that out as not a legitimate strategy it's just not a legitimate strategy most of the time it's a very niche strategy. Uh, but I, I will say USA over South Korea just for pure national pride. Uh, and then I agree it'll probably be uh, USA versus Finland at the final because I feel like Finland just was so – it's just the same argument I made earlier. Finland had so many looks that they could run in France while they, they could change their composition didn't really wow me on – other compositions like their sombra genji was pretty good i i don't want to downplay that that was actually pretty pretty phenomenal the way they could execute the dives and the hacks on that but finland just pulled everything off much much better so and finland has already taken two maps off of south korea and you could tell like that was the one time south korea actually really had to try and mm -hmm. any time any team that can make south korea actually try is immediately in the top three for me absolutely uh so you know i'm i'm expecting either us or south korea to go up against finland and uh you know i'm expecting you know slambo to get a couple picks around hopefully this year uh but you know if we do get the new patch you know we cannot count out the mangachu torbjorn if we do see the rework coming in which oh, yeah. could also sway things a little bit as well. Uh, but, you know, we're going to have to wait and see what patch we're being, uh, you know, played on for BlizzCon. 
And, you know, that could definitely change up the dynamic of, you know, some of these team approaches. Uh, but for now, you know, we're going to leave it at that. So let's go ahead and let's close out the show for tonight. So if you guys want to help us out, one of the best ways to do that is to leave us a review over on iTunes. We're always looking for, you know, ways to improve the show. Uh, we do have Con Before the Storm and World of Podcasts coming up. You know, during BlizzCon, uh, that will return on November 1st from the Hilton Anaheim. So be sure to check out this awesome community event. You know, they got a meet and greet, they have a pretty sick art gallery, and of course, there's World of Podcasts. So the Overwatch panel, as I mentioned, I'm going to plug this every week. So, uh, do it. Because, you know, it's, uh, it's free to download for everyone, you know, once it happens. Uh, so the Overwatch panel is at 10 p.m., it goes to 11 p.m., and it's on the fourth floor of the Hilton. You have Rob May moderating it from lab then also on the panel we have icy sorrow from enter the iris we have the blevins from high noon andres from onic lab and i'll recap police and bob from watchpoint radio i'll recap prepare to attack and i'll be uh you know filling in for you since you're unfortunately not able to make it womp womp uh, womp womp uh but we do have overwatch recall we will have a new episode drop in on tuesday a day later than normal uh with an interview with the cavalry and of course you now we have our weekly recall up on our website so check that out and uh you know i'm just gonna plug you know a new podcast that just started as well uh so you know you may have seen said person uh during the overwatch league uh that being seagull's number one fan you know the <laughs> guy that has the seagull mask <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, i know he started a new overwatch league podcast uh with other members of uh the game house mm -hmm. uh so you can check them out i know i tweeted them out yesterday on the overwatch recall twitter uh but you can find them uh they just recorded their first episode i believe it was on thursday and then they'll have a new episode recording live on tuesday night uh at like i want to say it was like 7 or seven thirty uh p.m so definitely check them out uh and you know i expect some pretty good things from them but, Spider, why don't you go ahead and let our listeners know where they can reach, you know, the podcast and our hosts over on the social media. Sure thing. If you'd like to email the show, you can do so at contact at OWLNshow.com. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at OWLNshow. You can find our website, www.OWLNshow. And then you can find us on YouTube. Uh, it's YouTube.com slash Overwatch League Network. Like I said, I'm currently working on a video for the PTR, so once that goes live, I'll put that video up, and you'll get to know all the changes and deal with my sarcastic wit, which at this point you've dealt with for two hours, so I assume you like it. Uh, you can find our Discord. It's discord.me slash OWLN show. Uh, our Twitch may surprise you, but it is twitch.tv slash OWLN show. Uh, we do... Uh, right now we're doing two primary shows. It's our main show is Mondays at 7 p.m. PDT. It is Overwatch League Network. We're mostly covering World Cup. We'll do you know some contender stuff when that starts up again. Uh, but like I said, that's our, our core show. Obviously, we have all the spicy drama and you know any confirmed announcements. We will definitely talk to you about. We also have our variety Overwatch show, Heroes Never Die, which is basically everything Overwatch. Uh, so I'm sure you guys will be getting ready to jump into the Junkenstein update whenever they announce that. And I'm sure you're going to have a whole lot to talk about this week with Torbjorn, because that <laughs> dropped after you recorded your show last week, even though you did a late show. But that show normally is Wednesdays at 5 p.m. PDT. And then we also do two host streams a week. And... I normally take Fridays at 7.30 PDT, but Totem, who normally takes Saturdays, is actually moving his. So when are you moving yours to Totem? Yeah, so uh, the weekends have been pretty busy for me, so I'm moving Saturday nights to Thursday nights. So I'm hoping to start that this week, uh, but who knows, things could always change. But Thursdays are, you know, traditionally more open for me, so hopefully, you know, I can be back into the swing of thing. Whether it's, you know, arcade chains or whatever. Uh, so expect some a little bit more consistency from me because uh, Saturday's not really been the best luck so far for me. No. So you can find myself on Twitter at SpiderGD. 
Uh, if you want to find me on Twitch, like I said, Fridays, 7.30 PDT, I will be here doing something. I mean, it varies week to week. Fridays is like my free night, so I, I make it up as I go along. Uh, mostly Overwatch related. If you'd like to find Slambo, which we really would at this point, um, he you can find him on Twitter at Slambo Overwatch. Uh, and where can they find you, Totem? Well, I'm on Twitter at TimelyDrunkCTR. And if I am live on Twitch, it is, of course, at our channel at twitch.tv slash OWLN show. But guys, that is going to do it for us here tonight on Overwatch League Network. Again, this has been episode 51. I am Tumbly Drunk, joined, as per usual, by my co-host, Spider. And somewhere off in the distance, we have, you know, my soulmate Slambo in the audio abyss. Uh, but we hope to see you back on Wednesday for Heroes Never Die. Have a good night. Thank you for listening to the Overwatch League Network. Be sure to follow the show on Twitter at OWLN Show. The theme music for OWLN is the main theme and victory theme guitar remix by Michael Madden.